Hello, everyone. I can see from the chat that it's both good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are. We're so glad you could join us today. Welcome to Will Pods Outlast the Pandemic. My name is Beth Hawkins. I'm the national correspondent for the 74 million, which is an education news outlet and the media sponsor of this event, which has been organized by the Vela Education Fund and the Center on Reinventing Public Education. We have a stellar roster of guests prepared to talk to us about an education innovation in the pandemic and whether one of its most intriguing developments will prove sustainable and indeed whether traditional school systems should be taking notes about the innovations on display. We should start with a tiny bit of housekeeping. Please use the chat function to ask questions. Our team will try to answer some directly via chat and will pass others along to me during the Q&A portion of our discussion. Feel free to use the chat for technical issues you have as well. This is a public meeting. We will be recording and live streaming this session and you should know that media are on this call, not least me. Um, all over the country, small groups of students who are learning together outside of a traditional school or classroom. They range from physical settings sponsored by existing community organizations able to provide space for social distancing and adult supervision for distance learning to organic grassroots collectives created by neighbors with common challenges. It's been my privilege to write about some of them. And let me tell you, when parents and students decide what they want the learning experience to look like, you end up with a rich kaleidoscope of arrangements. The last year has seen the creation of Afrocentric pods, farm pods, trauma-informed pods for children in the foster care system, pods that are the pandemic iteration of longstanding homeschool collectives, and in Indianapolis, pods organized by the public school system and its partners to ensure homeless students, children with disabilities, and other kids with steep odds would not fall through the cracks. The Vela Education Fund has made grants to a number of these learning models, and the Center on Reinventing Public Education has taken on the intriguing work of tracking their progress. We're gonna hear from three founders in just a minute, but first I wanna introduce you to Robin Lake, the director of the center whose interest in small, nimble, alternative education models predates COVID's disruption of the educational landscape. She and her team are committed to ensuring that the best of the innovations birthed by the pods can be used to drive improvement throughout K-12 education. Robin? Uh, thank you so much. It's such a, a joy to be with all of you today and an honor to join these um, amazing innovators. Uh, I will keep, um, I'll keep my remarks short because I think what we want to do is move quickly to the, the stories and the information on what's happening on the ground. But uh, but as Beth said, since the beginning of the pandemic, we at CRPE have been researching the ways that families and communities have stepped up to support students during the pandemic. And we were especially interested in understanding what would happen when folks were completely free to, comp to create educational experiences for kids from scratch. We thought that it was an important and really unique opportunity to learn what's possible when folks are unbounded by traditional assumptions about what school has to look like. So as we've watched what's unfolding around the country, we've seen that some of the most fascinating innovations are like those we'll hear about today, those that are emerging outside the system and including more than 250 organizations that the Vela Education Fund is supporting. We've also been tracking at the center, we've got I think something like uh, more than 300, 350 places around the country that are more of a uh, kind of institutional effort, places where nonprofits like the YMCA and Boys and Girls Clubs, cities, civic groups, museums and science centers have created learning pods to support students when schools were closed. And that often is happening in partnership with school districts, interestingly, so we can talk a little bit about that. But I think across that whole spectrum of pods, learning hubs, kind of micro schools, these interesting innovations, whether they're run by parents, community organizations, or school districts, they are all taking different approaches. Some of them look more like childcare efforts, and some of them are really playing with the boundaries of education and what, what it looks like. But I think what we all have in common across that spectrum is that they start with the student's unique needs, and they think of the student as the X that they're solving for. 
and building educational programs and supports that are responsive to those needs. I think that's the most important asset there. In essence, they're all essentially redefining school, whether it's thinking about who can be a teacher and how can we think more creatively at the job of teaching? What, where, and when does learning happen? How can community assets that have been out there all the time but have really been essentially untapped be married with education in a seamless integration? These are all really important things for us to take a look at, try to understand, document, and think creatively about. I do want to just note that what's important here isn't the cool factor, right? There's some really, really interesting things happening structurally, organizationally, but what has really moved me is the stories that we're hearing from the ground about how kids are responding to being able to work in a more a smaller, more personalized, and really, I think, more humane learning environment. So no doubt we'll hear about some of those stories today, and we'll hear about some of the challenges about running and sustaining these models. Those are important to get on the ground, too. The bottom line, though, is that we need to talk about these things. We need to understand them and think about what they might imply for the future. Um, and that's especially important as we hover around the brink of normalcy, as we think about getting back to normal and how we all want that desperately. And we think about the incredible opportunity that federal stimulus funds provide for thinking about how we can invest in school districts and rebuild in a way that's far better than what we had before. So that's why these, these lessons are important to to, um, to talk through today. We need to think about how to sustain the things that are out there right now that are working for kids and families. And we have to push people to think about why not us inside the school district? Why can't we think about taking some of these lessons and incorporating them into the traditional ways that we've always done schooling and kind of push the boundaries of what school districts can possibly do in the future? How can we fully meet the needs of students and families during the long road to pandemic recovery and beyond? Thank you, Robin. I think we're grateful that your team has taken on this work. Uh, so on to the folks on the ground. Bernita Bradley is the founder of Engaged Detroit in Detroit, Michigan, um, as well as the longstanding brain trust behind the Village PCL. With support from the National Parents Union, Bernita launched Engage Detroit, which is a homeschool co-op, part of a network specifically serving black families in response to the pandemic and the continued challenges of education in Detroit. Uh, the cooperative provides weekly one-on-one -on -one coaching to caregivers of 36 students. The coaching sessions range from an understanding of homeschooling law and regulations to developing an educational profile of each child and seeing how household resources can be leveraged for learning. Uh, the cooperative has a partnership with the Detroit College Access Network, which provides college and career support and virtual college tours. Families regularly reconvene for events including African drum lessons, educational field trips, a recent tour of State Line Corporation, the company that installs and maintains all the streetlights in Detroit, which is actually kind of an amazing story. Bernita, can you say a few words? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, I think a lot of our families would really appreciate the fact that they're getting uh, recognized for just taking that initial step to take the power of education back into their own hands, right? Um, during the first five months of the pandemic, we had a lot of families who were not receiving the support that they needed, including myself. Um, and <clears throat> we began to corral together and just say, like, what, what should we do about this? Like, what can we do? And uh, we fundamentally believe, like, if something hurts us, it hurts more than just our little circle of families, right? It hurts a broader community. and. So we started asking questions to families, like, what would you do if you could homeschool? Um, the families that were asking about homeschooling, because the understanding was that what everybody was doing and still are doing is pandemic schooling, right? Because homeschooling still doesn't look exactly the way we want it to look if we did not have a pandemic. But it's been so much better 
than what they were experiencing those four, four, first four months. Um, families were without technology. My daughter included only had interactions with one teacher. And that was really like catastrophic to the point that my daughter told me in June, if her senior year was like this, she was dropping out of school. And I was like, yeah, no, you won't. All right. I was like, yeah, that's not gonna happen. Not on my watch. And so um, we just start trying to find solutions and meeting with people who had already homeschooled to get a full understanding of it, um, to break some of those misconceptions, even in my own head. My daughter had asked me to homeschool her in fifth grade. And I was like, I don't want to be your enemy. Like, I, I want to love you. <laughs> I don't want to be your enemy as a teacher, right? And But not knowing fully what goes into homeschooling and not realizing that homeschooling is every intentional moment that a child sparks up an ideal in their mind. That becomes schooling. And homeschooling is not in the four walls of your own home. It's like every step you take in the backyard. If you're on a trip in Brazil, that is homeschooling. If you are on a trip to the market, that's homeschooling and taking advantage of that. And so that's what our coaches do. Our coaches um, coach the parents to understand what that looks like for their own individual children. And um, the idea of coaching for parents was that kids are always having coaches, like coaches for soccer, coaches for volleyball, coaches for all of this. Like we as parents are the ones who need to get our life together. <laughs> so that's what our coaches are helping us do through uh, Engage Detroit. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Katie Size is the director of Greengate Children's School in Wichita, Kansas. Um, Greengate is a small collaborative learning community for creative and active students preschool through grades five. Since 2008, Greengate has been a place for ch children to grow, create, imagine, and dream. Um, and I understand we're gonna be hearing about how much of that activity takes place outdoors. You won't find Greengate students in rows of desks. You won't find spells dictating a schedule. Students spend their days in flexible mixed age classroom spaces. Katie, tell us uh, a couple of minutes of, about Greengate. Thank you, Beth. Um, I'm really happy to be here to share about what we're doing at Greengate. Um, I'm the director and founder at Greengate Children's School. I've actually been in education for the last 24 years, um, but it wasn't until I had my own children that I started rethinking what education could look like and what I could do to help meet the individual needs of my own children. And I really wanted an experience that brought living life and learning together into one experience for them. And so um, when I looked around and I didn't find that happening, I decided that the best option for us was homeschooling. My kids are teenagers now, so we've, we've homeschooled for many years. And um, at the same time, I started researching other programs that were doing innovative things in education. And I, that's kind of where Greengate was born. We started Greengate in 2008 as an early childhood program that focused on play and early learning. And um, so we operated that actually out of our home for over a decade. And then in late 2019, I was a part of a fellowship program through 4.0 schools. And it was through that program and funding that we were able to expand and move into a um, two and a half acre property. And so we we're just finishing up the licensing process for that in March, 2020 and the pandemic hit. And when that happened, um, of course, everything changed as all of us have um, experienced. And so we really expanded what our vision was initially to meet the need of the community. And there was great need in the community for elementary age students. I mean, our schools were closed down as in most parts of the country. And we had essential workers and families who um, needed a place for their kids. They needed consistency and they needed a place where they could feel safe. They needed a school, but they more needed a community. And so we just um, kind of shifted in order to provide that and open a K through five micro school in addition to our preschool. And so that's the work that we've been doing here in Wichita. Thank you, Katie, for walking us through that. Uh, Elijah Moses is the executive director of Wise Young Builders, which operates in Washington, DC and Buffalo, New York. Um, 
Wise Young Builders operates in school, after school, and summer programs. Uh, and I forgot, Niagara Falls, New York, with plans to expand. Kids aged 8 to 12 not only learn to build bookshelves, chairs, furniture dollies, and other crafts, but study math concepts needed for their projects and read works by Booker T. Washington and other Afri African American authors, pardon me. Elijah, give us a minute or two overview of your program. Sure, Wise Young Builders is essentially just that. Uh, we're teaching uh, kids to be wise, like learn while they're young uh, and build. And then the whole kind of concept behind the program is leveraging the uh, necessity to touch math, to see math, to manipulate math, and not just uh, theory. It's theory and practicum together, right? So when we are building our small projects, whether it's our summer programs, you can see some of the kids here, uh, they have to measure them. They have to use implements of measuring. You know, we have an argument that a tape measure is 90% of the arithmetic that you learn in school. Uh, fractions, perimeter, uh, multiplication, addition, all of this kind of takes place on a tape measure. Uh, we started our program in Southeast DC and really it came at the advent of some moms who saw me teaching my son who was 10 at the time. And they really just kind of cajoled my, my wife and, and myself to, to teach it for their children. And we started out with a group of about 18 kids back in give or take 2011. The dates are often a little fuzzy when the, the exact first date was. And we kind of never looked back, uh, just kind of did out of school time programs, 2014 opened up summer camp programs and realized that we were really sitting on a gold mine in terms of how students can really engage live with mathematics and not just chalk and talk classrooms. Thank you for that. Um, I loved what Robin said in her remarks about students as the X that we're solving for. Um, and I, I would like, you've all touched on that a little bit, but perhaps we could, we could go a little bit deeper. Um, Bernita, you were solving for a very personal X when you launched Engage Detroit, were you not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, <clears throat> Excuse me. I think um, the idea was that when my daughter said something, um, like the, her and her friends had became their own support over the over those like first five months, and they were really trying to. They were really struggling. The other thing was that we kept seeing like kids in the surrounding communities had support, but a lot of the children in Detroit didn't. And and understanding that homeschooling traditionally in Detroit hasn't been like on the top of people's minds because of lack of support around homeschooling and how our white counterparts across cities have had that support. It was like, to me, let me show y'all how support can look, right? And, um, and let's design this together. Um, it's, it wasn't just like, I, you know, ideally designed by me. We're literally inventing this as we're going, as needs come up. We're reaching out to the decans. We're reaching out to the MSU School of Music. We're reaching out to whoever, as the kids are saying, they like something. Um, we're reaching out to those supports to get it for the families. Um, our goal is to make sure that that continues to show people how homeschooling can be in black communities with those supports intact. Um, and then the, uh, the other thing is to make sure that our parents have supports because they're working and understanding like homeschooling can be anytime, right? It's not that traditional 7.30 in the morning to three or that traditional eight to four, whatever. This can be on a Sunday afternoon, a Monday morning, whenever it is, whenever kids' interest is sparked, it's learning time, you know, and how we as parents engage them with that. That's because that, we have the power to do it. We just don't sometimes put it together in our heads the same way. So Moses, that, that makes me want to kick it over to you for a moment because um, long before the pandemic, you were solving for something similar, or rather, I guess the mothers in your homeschooling collective were um, hitting you up to, to fill a need. Yeah, so there was a homeschool collective uh, that, that we, I did a presentation for, and uh, although I did at one point home, I homeschool my son, he was, he's 20 now, so he's out of school, and not all of our students were initially homeschooled, maybe about 15 out of the initial 18 were, 
And what they were also looking for is programming, right? And I think to, to Bernita's point, we started Sunday afternoons from 2.30 to 4.30. And we did that for a number of years. And then around 2014, we launched the summer camp by partnering with the Prince George's Community College out in uh, Prince George's County, Maryland. And the problem still existed where parents were saying, my nine-year-old doesn't understand this. And whether they were in traditional public school, char you know, public charter schools or homeschool, they were all kind of facing the same problem. The kids didn't like math. They thought math was yucky. And it was just, you know, they were tangled in this web. And for us, it's like, oh, this is just simple. Like, we can't dump information to kids' heads, expect them to get it, because the inventors of mathematics were taking an account, like, okay, the river is right here, it floods every year, so we need to move the building X amount of feet where it stops flooding, that's something live and it's an activity. Uh, similarly, like when you have sheep and cows, if you will, all right, you have four sheep that just had children, uh, you know, how many you know, sheep or whatever they call it, child sheep, they had more and then it's four times four is 16. Now we have to do more things to feed them all. And this is a live function, right? And at some point uh, when you try to synthesize everything to make it all uniform and standardized, we have your conventional classrooms because everybody needs the same dose. And while that's not problematic in and of itself, um, while we can take, you know, equipment in where a kid can build a bookshelf, we're going to measure out 15 inches and then seven inches, we're going to cut it. You, you can't necessarily do that in a classroom with 20 or 25 kids. So for us, the problem was how to help children to realize that math is something you can like. And, you know, I tell, you know, parents and families all the time, we do not have kids fall asleep in our math classes, right? We play games and activities and, it is, I mean, it's like a football stadium sometimes. Like it's, it's engaging, it's loud and people love it, you know. So um, dynamite, perfect. Katie, I wonder if um, we could tap you to bring us into the, the here and now, so to speak about the X factor. And then I'm gonna ask if Robin can react really quickly to the commonalities and what she's heard. Um, Katie, bring us into the pandemic. You were operating a preschool, but then your community said, hey, we have this additional need, right. um, which actually sounds a bit like Bernita's in the sense of children out there um, in need of community and support. Right, exactly. Um, you know, going into this with the pandemic, we were really just building upon what we had already learned in the early childhood um, program and through our homeschooling with our own kids, um, that when children interact with materials and it becomes real to them, um, just like Elijah was saying, um, what happens is that it brings learning to life for them. And the what we found though, interestingly, was that these older kids had all come from public school settings where it was very teacher directed and they weren't used to having the time and space to play and explore their own ideas. And so um, what we ended up doing was giving them exactly what um, they needed and that was that time and space. And so we have to remember that play is essential to learning. Um, it's not something to be pushed to the sidelines until the real work um, of academics is done. That's how kids learn. That's how they understand their world. It's how they learn how to express and control their emotions. It's how they take risks um, and face challenges and solve problems and all of those things. And so um, at first, like I said, they didn't know what to do, but then some really cool things started emerging and you know, we would see kids over at the Hot Wheels tracks and they would see how um, the ramps at different um, elevations would cause the cars to um, win the race faster and things like that. There was like this really awesome game that the kids decided to, it was like a video game that they made into real life. And these are kids from five to 11, all playing and interacting together and developing their own rules and um, they had characters and roles and this went on for months and they, they owned that experience and they were able to apply those skills that they were learning in their play through that creative thinking 
to more academic standard things that they were doing and learning how to take ownership over their own learning is um, exactly what we are doing and that's our goal here. So Robin, what do you hear? I mean, these stories are so resonant to me. They, um, uh, you know, just about every one of these small learning communities is talking about how, um, in some ways, these are really simple things, you know, finding engaging ways to get academics into um, kids' brains and um, in finding ways to reach kids in creative ways, really getting to know and understanding kids and figuring out what motivating what motivates them. And so, I mean, these are um, these are things that I think um, when we talk to um, folks who are teaching in these small learning environments, they say, you know, some of them used to be in in large school districts, and this is their dream. You know, this is what they always wanted to do. And I think that's what the challenging notion is here is you know, every parent, every teacher wants these kinds of opportunities. How do we figure out how to make it happen more commonly? Um, and that's where the hard work begins. So let's, uh, let's move on to learnings um, because we're interested in, in what the learnings have been during this time and the related question of what you'll keep, what you wanna keep when the pandemic is over and what maybe we can let go of. Um, Moses, let's start with you. Do you have a, a moment on that? Yeah, I guess a couple of the learnings are just reaffirmation, right? So Jesus was a carpenter and Benjamin Franklin was a uh, like an inventor, an electrician, and he, had a, and he uh, worked as an apprentice shop. Uh, and then Henry Ford himself built a, a steam engine at 15 years old. And these people went on to be names that we hear every day. So I think one of the things that we realize is that during the pandemic, we did not shift to being online, right? And a lot of people ask us, oh, you can move your program online? No, we are just going to pause because we're hands-on and we prefer to keep it that way. Uh, and the other thing I, I think that we learned is that uh, in, in hockey, they say that uh, the best hockey players don't go to where the puck is, right? So while all the school system and, you know, that, and this is no disparage against school systems, they're just larger organizations. And to shift them is often like moving an elephant in the shopping cart, right? It's going to just take a long time. Well, we can be more nimble and go where education isn't traditionally going. Uh, and then hopefully some of the resources that, that, that go in that direction help follow. But I think it's always about for us continuing to keep on uh, sticking to the course of what we're doing and the results kind of prove themselves. Terrific. Thank you. Bernita, what would you say to the same question? Yeah, I think um, that one thing we learned is that uh, historically in Detroit, education has sucked for brown and black kids, right? Um, we only have 16% of our kids reading on grade level. And it's time. it was time for us to disrupt that in some kind of way, right? Take that ownership back into the hands of parents to say that, um, what can I do if schools won't partner with me to make sure my child has what they need to be educated? what can I do to build on those skills? Um, the things that we've learned is that parents are feeling that they have that authority again, like they are really in charge, right? It is no longer um, me having a conf conflict with a teacher to make sure my child gets it. And then understanding even the correlation between the carpentry and math, like Elijah was saying, right? Like if your child is at home and they are baking, that is science, right? That is science. It becomes a science project. It becomes this craft. We have this picture of one of our students who is baking pancake, making pancakes for his, uh, uh, and cake, one of them, he's making for his family. And this dude is bent over looking at the measurement glass like he is a mad scientist and he is enjoying it. Now this little boy is like every day wants to cook breakfast. His mom is like, okay, today you like, let me cook breakfast. But he's like wanting to add ingredients and see what he can do. So the learning is intentional. And for parents to see that and feel joy, that is just like wonderful. Katie, I can see you nodding. Um, yes, <laughs> all of that. I just, I love everything about what Bernita was saying. You know, I think what the pandemic 
has shown us is what the homeschooling sector and small micro schools and um, after school programs like Moses's um, and public charter schools, what all of these are recognizing is the essential element. And that is that education has to be about personalization, not standardization. Um, true learning is about relationships. And that's what Bernita was just saying. You know, parents are taking control over their child's education to make sure that their needs are being met. And that's exactly right. But when we work within community um, and get rid of this top-down approach to education and the people who are actually in the trenches with those kids, you know, wiping their tears when they struggle and um, watching the breakthroughs and what helped make that happen, that is when change happens. And so um, that relationship is where it all starts. Um, and I think like for our program, all, most of our families came from public schools because this was a solution for the pandemic. So now that things are starting to get back, you know, heading toward normal and next school year, um, likely schools will be fully open. They're already kind of doing that here now. Um, we kind of wondered well, what are people going to do, go back to public school. And um, instead we had 97% of our families decide to stay. And I think that the reason why is because they see a difference. They, may, they maybe didn't even know that, that they were looking for something more, um, but they have that relationship and that community and they say, see the difference within their individual child. Okay, so um, last question for me, and I can see some amazing audience questions already stacking up. So let's make it a lightning round and get to them quickly. Um, what resources and support do you need to sustain this work? Katie, let's, let's just continue on with you first. Um, you know, I think on two different levels. One, I mean, we operate, you know, it takes money to do, to operate a school. And so we try to keep our tuition as low as possible, but we are a tuition based school and that limits access. Um, so to have funding or parent choice within um, the education um, sector would allow access to these types of programs for more um, students. And then additionally, just like within the community, we need, like Elijah was talking about, we need to be able to connect with experts in the community to benefit our kids so that they can continue to grow as people. Elijah, I uh, know that this is a topic you're passionate about, and I'm sorry, Moses, I know this is a topic you're passionate about. Do you want to take it next? Oh, as far as resource development, we have a business model that kind of blends resources, but uh, we always like to attract, if you would, catalytic funders, right? Someone who's not given us a, a 200 page grant application with 70 other papers to fill out. While we do do some of those things, I think sometimes it's about attracting catalytic funders. Um, I also look at uh, people who are experts in their field uh, being able to assist. And I think to Katie's point, whether it's homeschool or non-conventional programs, I'd, I'd like to parallel like a music a &R, right? Or a scout for an NBA team who will go into the crevices of the community, find some peer talent that no one's ever seen and resurface it and make it mainstream, if you will. And I think that looking for people who have those type of uh, incentives to say like, hey, this is something that really works. Uh, and then whether it's you know mainstream funders, individual donors, um, or some of our own business models with events and, and contractors, et cetera, construction companies. We'd like to use and continue to leverage those opportunities to generate revenue for programming. Thank you. Bernita, what would allow Engage Detroit to uh, be even more engaged? Um, most definitely funding, right? We have a model where um, the parents that are currently in our cohort are being trained to train our model. So those parents are expected to train other parents moving forward in the next cohorts that we have. Um, the other thing is partnerships, right? We have Niles Community School District, which is two hours away from us. Um, they have partnerships with their local school district that actually helps fund homeschooling, right? Like other, other people across the country has that, um, these hybrid models. Our local schools and um, 
or schools that are closer to us, the Niles Community District partner with us, you know, bring in those partnerships even across the country. The other thing I would say is funders, some of the philanthropy organizations um, need to see value in these type of projects because um, too long, I feel like we've been given these one-off solutions where money's been poured into systems that are not working for our children. And where you see it working for our children, those are the things that need to be funded. And innovation product projects like this needs to really have that chance to be longevity, not just a one-off. This is not just a pandemic thing, right? This is something that will be sustained after the pandemic. And Robin. Beth, can I, can I add one more quick comment? Bernita just hit something. I'll only take a second. Can I? Um, so two of the things I think that would be helpful probably for all programs. One is that a shift in public policy. So I know traditionally there's a per pupil allotment, uh, students or school districts get the, the per pupil allotment. And some of that money, if parents choose to homeschool, should be shifted to a portion for parents, right? So that would be helpful to sustain. That way we don't need necessarily funders. Another quick thing that I think is that could happen is that uh, institutions also make available uh, some of the other resources that they have. So gymnasiums and swimming pools, et cetera, uh, because, you know, we can't be a school district, right? I mean, some programs can't reinvent, you know, a, a billion dollar budget. So I think that those things could also be helpful in terms of funding and resource development. I think that's an excellent point. Um, and what I've heard you address before. So I think the first audience question will direct first to Robin. Um, and we're doing pretty well on time. So depending on what else is queued up, maybe uh, other folks can react after Robin feels it. Robin, we have an audience member who says, what I'm hearing is that these wonderful programs have disrupted the traditional notion of schooling. And I wonder how school and or district led pods are either reinforcing these traditional notions, which are often inequitable or disrupting them. That's a great question. Um, so, um, you know, I think what we're seeing is traditional school systems realizing that as they look to the next two to five years, they have enormity of need to address with their kids. It's astounding, right? Just, just the academics alone, but then pile on top of that kids, social emotional needs, mental health needs. And I think they are, many of them are really open and interested in partnerships right now in ways that maybe they hadn't been before. And so what we're seeing is uh, we're working with six school districts uh, in partnership with TNTP to, um, uh, to support their partnership with community-based organizations to do learning hubs like this. And you know, meeting the moment for kids, but also thinking about as they look forward, maybe they need to reinvent high school um, for the next little while or into perpetuity. And so how can they use this experimental space to try out some things and learn about what's working for kids? So I think it's really interesting. I think there's real potential here. And I don't mean to downplay the, um, the challenges ahead for overcoming some of, them, some of those institutional barriers that we know exist and are very, very hard to disrupt. But I think it's dangerous territory to get into binary thinking on this. So if we think about, you know, it's either we create these things outside the system or we disrupt the system, there is really interesting space in between. And I think all of that can and should coexist. And there can be a variety of different funding models and, um, and approaches even within a given state to try some of that out and see what's working. But I think you know, the, the worst thing that we can do right now is think about these things as operating outside the system and, and thinking of it as a separate problem. That's actually just an incredibly tidy segue to the next audience question, um, which perhaps we'll just direct this to uh, Moses first. Uh, how can we surface all the out of school, after school, summertime camps programming that are already out there to include them as options for learners? This is a question that I'm hearing a lot in my own community, actually. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. So I think that um, sometimes, 
organizations and uh, programs can't surface as much because of lack of bandwidth, right? So, you know, if you don't have a, you know, $1.3 million budget or whatever budget is, you probably can't advertise as much to the community to be able to enroll students and or you don't have the space. So I think that some of it is just digging. Like people find, like when we first really kind of started, people were telling us, oh, I Googled and found you. Like how, right? I mean, we were on Google, no doubt, but like, how did you find us? Like out of all the programs that would have popped up. So I think it's about bandwidth. Um, I also think about um, more collaboration. So I think that there are some hubs. So for example, there's a group called Fair Chance in DC that we're a part of. It's a pretty much an executive director and, and nonprofit learning community and capacity building organization that you, if you go to Fair Chance and they have probably 60 different programs and it's all different types of educational programs. So I think that more of those coaching and learning hubs popping up to be able to be a point for parents, for families, for schools, for partnerships and organizations. Katie, do you wanna chime in on this? Um, yes, I, I think that depending on where you are in the country, um, there are more resources like that available. Like in our part of the country, um, you know, our, we don't have a centralized, um, you know, place even online where parents can find those resources. It's just kind of an informal thing where moms are parts of different groups and, um, on Facebook or whatever and try to connect and find pull from what they need. And that's, that's a wonderful resource too. But I think in our community, that is what we're going to be working on um, growing is consolidating all of those different options that parents have so they can go to one place and find what's best for their kids, depending on the needs of their family. Grenita, you're uh, the original connector. So I imagine you have thoughts mm -hmm. on this as well. I sure do. So I, um, I'm a person who build intentional relationships uh, just to make sure that community is always connected. Um, um, we here in Detroit have something called Show Your Spark. So they have a lot of programs on that for families to participate. The problem is a lot of people have forgotten homeschool families, right? Um, so a lot of their enrollment processes say like things about how the child can engage if they participate in this school or that school, but it does not say homeschool. And so uh, I would challenge everybody to like expand their thinking on how they enroll children into their programs, into their scholarship programs and internships and everything, right? Like where they're getting transcripts from, don't exclude one uh, homeschoolers. Um, the other thing is, um, if I can go back to that, uh, that disruptors conversation, so I'm a natural born disruptor. I've uh, grown to embrace that. <laughs> and um, uh, in August, our super local superintendent made a comment about families not being um, literate enough and the economical status being very low of students in the city of Detroit to homeschool or do pods. So I was like, let me show you better than I can tell you, right? <laughs> let, me, let me put some teeth to the iron and show you. And so with that, don't assume that families can't do this. Partner with families because families are tapping out. And while I am doing this challenge, I'm also an advocate for education and how families tap out. Families should not tap out and not have the support or not know how to do it because then we too end up with our children not having what they need, right? If we don't know or have the tools to do it. So either partner with us or give us the tools, give us access to the tools to do it, but don't leave families out there. Because if you're really in it for all the children to be successful, that includes homeschool families too. Let's go ahead, um, um, pop in here for one second to um, just, um, Bernita's comment made me think of Oakland. Oakland Reach is an incredible, um, a parent advocacy organization that during the pandemic stepped in to run an early literacy program for their kids with evidence-based literacy. Um, and they did parent coaching, Bernita, like you're doing. And it's been an incredible success, amazing outcomes. And what is interesting is um, the school district looked at them and said, you know what? I think we can work with you and I think we can learn from you. So let's sit down together and think about how we can do parent coaching throughout the district. 
uh, let's sit down and talk about what you're doing around literacy that's working for your kids and how we can incorporate that into more Oakland schools. And look, we don't need, we, we should not be Pollyannish about this. <laughs> you know, large institutions are, are very, very difficult to change, but, uh, but it can happen and let's make sure that we're not ignoring those possibilities. So Robin, hang around for one second, please. Uh, we can start the next question with you. And it's a, it's a really next level question. Um, what are your thoughts on the role of teacher preparation programs in educating parents and providing them with teacher credentialing and training? Yes, yes. I actually uh, talked to Lakeisha Young at Oakland Reach about this uh, a couple months ago. And I said, you know, why not? Why not? You know, your parents have just engaged in this challenge of being their kid's first teacher. And let's see where we could take that. And she, you know, her, her brain was just firing on this. I think it's a, I think it's a really interesting possibility along the whole spectrum of what we can consider teacher certification. I mean, just investing in, te in, in parents as tutors, as we think about large scale tutoring programs, how come we're not talking about giving money to support parents in that role right now. But if you took it to the next level and you thought about who are the parents who have just really engaged in this teaching endeavor during the pandemic and would like to take it to the next level, and maybe there's an opportunity for a new career path for them. That's a win-win. Uh, Bernita, uh, yeah. you chime yeah. in on this. Yeah, so um, I'd love to uh, paint a picture really quick for you guys. In early childhood education, students go to school, right? And they are God in the classroom. They are sitting in the classroom. If they want to play in the kitchen today, the teacher's like, well, let's go play in the kitchen. If they want to play on the, on the tires, they're like, let's play on the tires. But every moment becomes an intentional moment for a child to learn. But then when a child gets in K-12, that child is driven to walk a straight line. Everyone must count one at the same time. Everyone must say purple at the same time. Pick only the purple crayon. If you pick the red crayon, you are being rebellious. That is when teachers lose it with children, right? Especially children who have been in early childhood. If we are not educating teachers to keep the autonomy of early childhood, then we've lost the first part of the battle. That's one of the greatest uh, go back to's we can do when it comes down to reinventing school. Educators need to understand, let our children guide learning, let them guide this education process and get what they need out of the education process and quit pushing agendas quit pushing policy, quit pushing testing as much as you're pushing. Like how, how, how can you test a child who right now they're testing kids um, based on the pandemic? How are you testing kids when some children were like, I don't even learn online. I can't even fathom what you, you taught me the last year, but yet you want me to go and test. And if I test poorly, then I look like the problem and not your system. So I think uh, we'll, move on to the what's probably going to be our last question um, and start with Katie. Um, Place-based schooling and individualized competency-based learning have been with us for decades as examples and cool alternatives. How do we dismantle the standardized testing and Carnegie unit approach to schools so we can do this at scale? And I'm asking you because I saw on your website your very creative assessment schedule. Yes, um, yeah, Com competency-based education is kind of, um, in, in regards to assessment, is kind of gaining some ground. Um, and I would love to see more of that happening. That's exactly what we do at Green Gate. We toss the you know standard A, A, B, C, D, F scale out the window, and we focus on kids really learning and the process that that takes to get there. And our kids are challenged and they take, um, they take ownership over that learning process, but they do so in a way that's very personal and very organic. So, so learning doesn't stop happening just because we stop putting a grade on it. <laughs> Um, it keeps happening, and when we focus on the whole child, every part of their development as people, 
and stop worrying about purely academics and passing the test and covering content and broaden out those standards so that they're not as specific, but more um, guidelines for who we want people to be in our, in our society, then we allow for flexibility and adaptability within environments. And we allow teachers to be creative and touch kids in the way that they um, need to get that information. And when we give kids, most importantly, that time and space, like Bernita was saying in early childhood, that's pretty much what we did. We transferred our, our early childhood philosophy, that's where most of my background comes from, and plugged it into older an older kid's um, environment, and they have flourished. It is amazing to see the thinking that that's going on in these kids, and they're taking that and applying it to the academics as well. Um, so that I think that that I don't know how to do it <laughs> to answer the question, but I think that it can be done. And there are some resources out there. Um, I don't have them on hand right now, but people are, are have some amazing systems that they've developed regarding competency based assessment. So I think that leaves 90 seconds apiece for the same question for Moses and Robin, and then I'll uh, draw us to a close. Moses. Oh, cool. I'll go and I'll say, uh, Bernita made a point earlier that 91% uh, of kids weren't reading on literacy level. And I think, um, you know, sometimes funders or school districts like, hey, prove what you're doing works. And we always say, well, prove what you're doing works, right? Because like if 91% or 57% of kids are graduating, then we need to question what you're doing also. Um, in terms of how to make this more uh, robust, if you would, I think one of the things we need to do is question what education is, because people have their own definition of education. People have their own definition of school. So when you look into the root words of education, it's to induce, right? D-U-C-A is a Latin root, to induce. And that means to bring out that which is within. So for us, we induce children to bring out that is which within. And if you are really good at this versus good at that, then that's how we uh, essentially try to cater our, our program and education towards you. Now, how to do that on a larger level, level, that's the last thing I'd like to say is that we'd have to look at who's all losing and gaining by education being what it is. And I think that when I started to look into running schools and the institutions I work for and uh, you know who writes and sells curriculum, it's a lot of people making a lot of money off this stuff, right? And they have a vested interest in it and staying the same way. Excellent. Robin. Yeah, I'll just throw in that, um, you know, as we think about this from a policy side from state, um, so state and local policies around seat time requirements, standards, assessments, accountability, all of that. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity ahead of us. I think the pandemic has really put things in perspective for people around the fact that you know, it really doesn't matter how long kids are sitting in a seat, staring at a computer or even in a classroom, it matters what they're learning, right? That's obvious. <laughs> Let's figure that out. Um, you know, maybe um, this crazy set of standards, um, the complexity of them needs to be simplified to what kids really, really need to know. And let's zoom in on those things and let some of that other stuff go away. Um, maybe it's time to recognize that Yes, right now kids are learning at very different levels and they have always been doing that. So let's figure out how to accommodate. I think there's a, so my point is, I think there's a new openness to that, a new um, uh, opportunity for us to think about redefining assessments, accountability, standards, those kinds of things. Um, and it's more important than ever that we make sure that all kids are getting what they need. So let's do the work. Wow, uh, we've packed a lot into an hour, a lot. This was a terrific discussion. I would like to remind everybody that the recording of this session, since there was so much packed into it, you're gonna wanna watch it again. And additional resources will be available via the Center for Reinventing Public Education and Bella Education Fund's YouTube pages. And of course, at the 74 million, if you wanna revisit any of the insights raised here. I want to thank our esteemed panelists, Katie Size, Elijah Modes, and Bernita Bradley for sharing their insights and giving us so much of their time today, and Robin Lake for sharing your research and perspective. And of course, thank you to all of the participants who showed up and kept this lively. Take care, everybody.